Uh, good morning, sir. Can you see and hear me? Yes, I can. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good morning, Mr. Um, Ismay. Can we uh, pick up where we left off last night uh, yes. with the email chain that we were looking at before the um, technology failed us? It was poll 3055100. Thank you. And just to um, refresh your memory, because it was last night, on the second page of this document, you'll remember that the defense solicitor, Izzy Hogg, had set out three requests. That had worked its way through to John L. Singh. We can see from the top of the page. And then we go to page one at the bottom. We can see that on behalf of John L. Singh, uh, that email was forwarded to uh, Mr. Longman and counsel, uh, Mr. Tatford, and we look at the top of the page. Um, we can see the second email down. Mr. Wynn, who receives the chain, replies to Mr. Longman. Rod Ismay, the head of PMBA, is not happy at the prospect of an open-ended invite. He's asked the question of what are the legal parameters we're working with? Simplistically, if we refuse or impose conditions, what, uh, do we lose the case? I think we need more guidance on how something like this might reasonably operate. And I'd ask you about uh, what Andrew Wynn himself had said concerning um, this email chain. And he told the chairman that he understood your reply uh, was a reply that was seeking to close down the disclosure request as much as possible, and I asked you whether that was your intention. And you said last night, um, no, there were two things here. You would expect the criminal law team to be overseeing the compilation of whatever needed to be submitted, and not for there to be a side conversation between me as part of the organization with the defense lawyer. So I felt that the request should be coming to me from the criminal law team. So just dealing with that answer first, the request was coming from the criminal law team. It was coming indirectly from the criminal law team. I was surprised that that um, Janelle, I would have given the importance of the matter, I would have expected Janelle to have been directly in contact. Um, and because the request was specified by the defence, which may well, have been a, may well have been a very valid request to make, but I would have expected, uh, I would have expected the post office criminal law team to have been the ones explicitly saying to me, "This um, can you do this, Rod?" Which, of course, I would have responded to. Now, you, you've shared a, an email um, uh, that, that was on the screen a couple of screens ago. I think it's got a phrase in it that says, John Ail, please send me your instructions. I, I, I find that a kind of a puzzling phrase. It's not like, um, John Ail, we've agreed, and you've agreed that uh, Mr Ismay should provide certain things. It says, please advise me your in instructions. And that, to me, sort of sounds like, well, there's, there's some discussion going on here. So I think when Andy Wynn was at the hearing, he did say what he said, and, and before that, I think he said, I think, I know Rod, I think he would have been seeking clarification. He perhaps didn't understand the question. And then when you asked him the question again, he proceeded, as you said, ex exactly as you said earlier. But I, I was seeking clarification because I was surprised not to be being approached by post office criminal law team. And I certainly didn't think that, didn't feel appropriate to me to be initiate be engaging in direct correspondence with the defence team, I would have absolutely expected the post office criminal lawyer to specify what was needed to gather that from me or to facilitate any visits that were necessary and, and for that to be managed through a single point of contact who was acting on that case. That was, that was absolutely the, the fundamental reason for it. 
that and Andy and, and these notes also say Rod wasn't happy. So I think that's the first reason. And yesterday I said there were going to be two reasons I wanted to expand on. Firstly was um, what, what was that, the approach of, of the leading the criminal law team involvement. The second, I think, was, was just that because I wasn't happy about another review, yes, because at the time we were gearing up for Royal Mail privatisation. I'd got lean process improvement reviews being done in my team. I'd got business transformation projects going on, which entailed sensible uh, process reviews in different teams. But I was feeling a bit like my team was constantly subject to review, and therefore this, which if Janelle agreed it was necessary, was an absolutely important review that I should facilitate, but Janelle hadn't told me that, and I was already on the receiving end of a number of active reviews for business process improvement purposes, which were proving very demanding in my team, so I wasn't happy about the idea of another review. But if Janelle came and said, Rod, Rod this is what the, the, what the post office criminal law team uh, feel needs doing, then absolutely I would have followed that. But I hope that gives a context as to why Andy perceived that I wasn't happy at the, um, the uh, request there. That, that um, reason that you weren't happy with the process being followed, that the criminal law team should give instructions to their client, you, as to uh, what examination should or should not be permitted, didn't find its way into this email chain, did it? No. It, it, the process it, it, issue. I don't think a clear instruction from our criminal law team to me came to me to say what to do. I was copied in on an email, I think, that you, you shared there that says, from the defence solicitors, we await your instructions. Well, I don't know what that means. Well, hold on. Um, if we look at the foot of the page, please. The email at the bottom. Yeah. Jarnell is asking Mr. Longman, who worked for you. Yeah, yeah. No, he, um, no, he didn't at that time. Who did Mr. Longman work for at this time? Um, John, I think, would have been part of the security team. They weren't within your area of responsibility by this time? No, and... In terms of the security team, the, the investigations part of the security team had been part of my uh, remit in 2005 for about a year. Um, there's another whole part of security, but, but the, the, the John was not part of my team, no. It, it, Why did this come through to you then, to your, your team? Um, so John, well, I, I, I think that I think that Izzy Hogg's request on the further down below two or th page two or three of this document. Yep. I, th I think her request was for um, access to s systems in the Midlands. Uh, yeah, yeah, so um, that, that would have meant Chesterfield, I think. That would have meant the product and branch accounting team. Um, and therefore, if John Ailes passed this to John, John had come to the right area to ask a question, but the nature of the whole question didn't feel like the post office criminal law team come in and saying we are leading the collation of the response in this case and Rod within the construction of post office limited's defence pack or oh, post office limited's prosecution pack um, please can you uh, facilitate this I, I, I was receiving something third hand suggesting that I should agree to something with a defence solicitor which I, my perception is that that wouldn't be how a case would be handled there would be a, the law team in the post office would manage the relationship between the two law teams. Just um, scrolling up to Mr Singh's email at the foot of the uh, first page. Thank you. He says in the second line, Can you, uh, could you please be kind enough to let me have your urgent instructions as to the access and information she's requesting? That's a perfectly normal request, isn't it, from a lawyer to their client? Well, it, it might be a legal it, language, but to me to say, let me have your urgent instructions, could be, are you instructing me to do something or not? I, 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 I don't, that is not language that means something to me as a non-lawyer, your urgent instructions. Mr Wynne told the um, <laughs> chair that um, the reasons that you gave for wishing to shut down as much as possible this disclosure request 
were that, firstly, you believed the examination wouldn't produce anything, i.e. the defence examination sought wouldn't prove it, uh, produce anything, and secondly, it would create more questions than it would answer. Is he correct that those were the reasons that you gave for not wishing to allow the defence the access to the systems that they sought? The reasons, so that and the other two reasons that I've given already, uh, yes. So given that the allegations were being made about the Horizon system, the idea of doing a review um, in the product and branch team who were not using Horizon would seem to me to not have been looking at the particular system that allegations were made about and therefore would have continued to have questions after that review because we wouldn't have been able in my team in Chesterfield to have shown or answered uh, questions about the Horizon system. The request, if we go to the second page, concerned access to the system in the Midlands. Right, OK. Yeah. Uh, secondly, it concerned access to the <laughs> operations centre in Chesterfield. Right. Yeah. And thirdly, it sought access to system change requests, known error log, new release documentation to understand what problems have had to be fixed. It was um, a broader request than simply access to systems in Chesterfield, wasn't it? That, that was a, a broader question than Chesterfield systems, because to the best of my knowledge, the known error log, I think, was a phrase about horizon issues. I think if, if the SAP system that my team used, if it had an issue, I don't think that would have been called a known error log item. So I but think that third bullet point reads to me as being a Horizon-related topic. Putting it bluntly, um, Mr Ismay, was the real reason that you didn't wish to give access, that you were concerned that this might be another form of independent review, exactly the type of independent review or examination that you and your colleagues within the post office did not want to happen? No. No, it, it wasn't, and I think there's something that's referred to in one of the other documents in, in the PACS, but somewhere in the chain of events around this time, we had the post office had conversation, I'm not sure who when I say we, somebody in the post office had conversations with some postmaster representatives, which had led to a small working group of um, of sub-postmasters, active sub-postmasters, coming and looking at some of the things in Chesterfield. So I recall a number of meetings where um, um, I think four sub-postmasters uh, came in, um, and, and I think it was related to the, the second site process, and therefore I'd, I'd already had a kind of a scenario of, very helpfully, having a dialogue with, sorry, with um, some postmaster colleagues in Chesterfield. When was the second site process? Um, I don't, in, in respect of this timeline... Um, later. Right, OK, yes, I'm sorry. So by by that years. Would have been, yes, I'm sorry, that would have been later. I'm sorry, yes. And inviting four postmasters into Chesterfield a couple of years later, not really the same as allowing an expert access to a system and access to documentation to understand any errors or bugs within it. Agreed? Yeah, I, I agree that, and I'm, I'm, I'm sorry about, with all the things that I was involved in, I'm sorry that I've mixed up timeline there. Was your concern here that an independent investigation may show that there were issues of unreliability with Horizon? No. No, my, my concerns were about the centrality of the criminal law team to lead on the dialogue here. My concern was, um, I suppose, a workload thing of how many reviews my team were already involved in with different people coming to review processes in my team. And that fundamentally was why I, my chin would have dropped at the prospect of another, uh, another <coughs> review in the team. If we go back to the first page, please, we can see that Mr. Wynne's email in the middle of the page reporting his conversation with you yeah. is dated the 27th of July, 2010. Right. 
And so the conversation to which it refers presumably would have occurred whilst you were writing your report. Remembering your report's final version has a date of the 2nd of August um, on it. So it's uh, within the same week. Yeah, uh, yeah, it probably is, yes, yeah. Did the fact that you were being asked by the managing director of the company to write a report that gave Horizon a clean bill of health influence your decision not to allow at the same time an independent uh, defence expert access to the system? Um, no, and I think I'd just like to expand on the no there. So I think my reason was the two things that I've um, referred to a number of times about the criminal law team and the number of views in the team. I think, actually, you've helpfully pointed out to me that this was in the week before my other report summation was dated, which I'd forgotten. Um, so I think given that I was described yesterday that I was burning the midnight oil to collate the report for David Smith, I think that would probably be another reason why a request coming in for a review in Chesterfield at the same time as I was burning the midnight oil on that other report would have been another reason for me um, coming across uh, not happy at the prospect of an open-ended invite. Does the fate of a defendant and their request for access to a computer system turn on how tired you were? No, it certainly doesn't, but I think it turns on what the criminal law team should be collating for the post office and asking me to, to gather, not for me to have a relationship directly with the defence team. I think that I'm, I'm sure that the situation for the defendant in this case is awful, and I'm really sorry for all the, the chain of events that's happened here. This, this is horrible. But in a legal process, my understanding is that the criminal law team and the post office lawyers should be the representatives facing the defence solicitors and that they, the post office solicitors, should be gathering the information, not for ad hoc individuals around the organisation to be initiating um, separate conversations, separate to a law team who are trying to contain, who are trying to com compile um, a, a, a consistent and comprehensive pack. Nobody's asking you to have contact with the defence solicitors. Nobody's asking you to... But they are. Uh, they're, in, asking, in, they're asking uh, me to accept an open-ended invite of somebody coming to Chesterfield. They're asking for your instructions, something lawyers do to their clients every day of the week. Well, I, I think I've explained that that phrase of asking instructions doesn't mean anything to me. That, that, that is not a phrase that I'm familiar with. Asking your instructions leads me to think, well, my instruction is go and ask the criminal law team to come back and tell me what the post office team think I need to provide. Can we turn on, please, to poll 305, 5225? Thank you. And so just remembering the chronology, that last exchange ended on the 27th of July. Right. Your report, the 2nd of August. Yep. Uh, we're now on the 13th of September. Okay. Still dealing um, with, um, the, in the subject line there, the Seema Misra case. Yes. Uh, we can see this is um, an email from Zoe Topham, the former agent's debt um, section within the post office to Mr. Longman. You're neither a sender or a recipient of it, but you'll see in a moment we're referred to. Yes. She says, hi, John. The last update I had on the above was in July. The defence solicitors had requested they had access to the operations in Chesterfield. This was discussed by Andy Wynne, Rod Ismay. I've today spoken with Andy Wynne, who's informed me that Rod had made a decision not to allow this. Could you update me with the latest progress uh, on the case? You, you saw from the last email that um, it was said that you, you weren't happy and you were asked a couple of questions. In the interim, had you made a decision, as this email records, that you would not allow the access sought? I don't think so. I think if the post office defence team, no, if the post office prosecution team had, had come and said that something needed doing, I would have absolutely have followed it. I, I, I have got no idea what other 
conversations, if any, happened after the one that's referred to in the July chain and up to this one. I can't remember the things, and it's quite possible that this email was just reiterating the feelings that came out from the conversation before. I don't, I don't, I genuinely don't know whether I had another conversation in there, but I was not in a position to be able to say what should or should not happen in respect of information gathering for a prosecution case. It was absolutely for the post office solicitors to say what needed to happen. I could not make a decision like that. And, and I, would have, I would have thought that if, if I had attempted to do something like that, the post office solicitors would have overruled me. So would I have overruled me. So I, 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 I would not have been in a position to make a decision about um, if, if a matter was agreed between the prosecution team and the defence team to say that something should happen, then that would not be something for me to make a decision on. That would be something for me to deploy. Uh, can we move forwards, please, to poll 3055418? An email um, principally between lawyers, Mandy Talbot to John L. Singh, but copied to you, dated the 8th of October 2010. So this is um, a few months after you've written your report, a few months after those email exchanges yes. that we've looked at. Yes. And this is the Friday before Seema Misra was due to go on trial on the Monday morning. Okay, right. You'll see that um, uh, Mandy Talbot emails John L. Singh and says, Mike and Rod are also very interested in any developments at the trial next week which impact on Horizon. You promised to let me know if anything unfortunate occurred in respect of Horizon. Please can you copy Rod and Mike into any messages? Incidentally, I assume you've briefed external relations. Could you please let us know who you've briefed? Because Mike and Rod may wish to have input into any story relating to Horizon. They may give you a call for an update. Incidentally, Postmasters for Justice met with the minister this week and were accompanied by Izzy Hogg and the lady from Shoesmiths. You were evidently interested in um, public relations here because you are recorded as uh, having a possible interest in inputting into a story about Horizon. Is that right? You wanted to be part of the story making for Horizon? No, I didn't want to be part of the story relating to Horizon. Let me add some more things to that. So. Mandy's written an email here. This isn't an email from me that says I'm interested in writing into the story. However, given that I'd been asked by Dave Smith only a month or so earlier, or two months earlier, to collate that report to Dave Smith, where he was asking for positive reasons to be assured about Horizon, obviously this would be very much in my mind. There's been several bits of correspondence you've shared about this case, so this very case was very much in my mind. I'd just been asked by the MD to produce that report, and therefore it was probably in my mind at the time, well, maybe Dave might ask me to collect something else, and therefore I would want to be um, aware of any progress on something that was going on, given that the MD had very recently asked me to do, uh, do a report on that. So I would think that what I've just said would be the reasons why I would have had an interest in it, given that, obviously, there was a lot of um, press analysis of it, then from, from Amanda's point of view, she would be aware there was lots of press in it and may have conflated me thinking about press with me thinking about having written um, a report to the managing director. So I would, that, that is what I think my interest would have been that would have caused me to have been on the radar for um, being keen to have updates on the, the, the outcomes of the case, having so recently done that um, summation compilation for Dave Smith. 
Or was it that so long as nothing unfortunate happened at the trial, you saw it as an opportunity to minimise any bad press and go on the front foot and put a story out? No. So, uh, as you just said, or was it an opportunity? And, and it wasn't. I think that it was, for the reasons that I stated before that, that was my rationale, not for that other opportunity. Was it that by now you had become one of the key figures within the post office who was a leader on defending the integrity of the Horizon system? Having written your report, you were going to be the flag bearer or one of them for the integrity of the Horizon system? I think I was clearly seen as somebody who was able to talk to other lots of parts of the organisation to pull together a summary related to this situation. I, I think it, I asked myself, looking back at it, I, I was managing the products and branch accounting team, which was inherently very close to some postmaster and other post office transactions, but I was not in charge of the Horizon system. So I do ask myself several times, how on earth was it that I ended up being the one who was being invited to collate this report? And I think that was because I had got a decent understanding of lots of stuff across the organisation. But frankly, why wasn't it an IT person who'd collated that report about the system? I don't know. It was me. Dave came to me to ask me to do it. You know, so, yes, I'm clearly um, somebody who had, had, had got a level of understanding about the Horizon system, a level of understanding about transactions in branches. I'd got relationships with a number of, um, if you like, the, I think we talked about the um, NFSP meetings and things in some other uh, material. So there's, there's, there's been lots of activity where... I was meeting people to, to try to look through the eyes of some postmasters, and I realised a phrase such as I've just used then, you, you might rightly, and, and some other people may say, well, that's, that's an awful phrase to use, given the awful events that we've got here. But I was very much trying to, to do that in, in, in my role, and that probably made me, as a back office finance person, sound unusually um, keen on understanding things at the front end because I was passionate about post offices. I was passionate about well, that's why I joined the post office in the first place. This was an organisation right at the heart of the community, part of the national interest. Um, the previous finance director had described it as something about post offices fundamental to social cohesion. Me, have been, I was humbled to have the opportunity to, to work at the post office and I'm horrified that all these events have happened and that I'm in here talking in this situation of this awful chain of events that's happened here. But yes, in the post office, I think I was recognised as somebody who'd got a um, significant amount of understanding of things to comment on, but it mystifies me sometimes looking back at it just to think, well, why was it that me managing a back office finance team was the person asked to collate some of these things um, and, and to be answering questions about a system that I did not own and which, when we've had at the end of my witness statement, asked for other reflections on things for the, for the past, I've made a comment about, I think, moving forward, it would be really important for the organisation to be clear about the individuals who are the owners of systems in the organisation because I think structurally it will be quite clear. I was managing a back office finance team that would not be the owner of the Horizon system. Why, therefore, were so many things coming to me? And I know, I know across the whole of social media, there's a number of people referring to the Ismay report. Well, I collated something for lots of people across the organisation. I'm, 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 I'm increasingly mystified looking back. Where were IT in there? Why was it that it was me that was the, 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 the collator of, of this? But I, I tried in the best faith to do the best compilation of things and the best response to matters that were going on, but was always of an understanding that there was a lead from the criminal law team in these. Rather than the reasons that you've given, did you want to have an input into the story to set the narrative relating to Horizon? 
because you were now seeing as a pliant individual, a good company man who would deliver the goods by producing a one-sided, unbalanced piece. And you wanted to get that one-sided, unbalanced piece out into the media. Um, no, as you say, is there another scenario and was that the scenario and no, and for the reasons that I've articulated earlier, no. Who was um, Mike Granville? What role did he perform? Uh, Mike, um, um, his role was, but I, I know the kind of nature of what he, so he would have had a lot of contact with uh, the, the BIS. Um, he, uh, I think his role title was probably something like stakeholder relations. So he, I know he had a lot of discussions with stakeholders such as the NFSP, and I think some of the um, departments for uh, business and innovations and skills or its predecessors, I think he would have had conversations with um, um, people in, in that organisation, the shareholder organisation. But were you reporting back to any directors at this time about the uh, Seema Misra case and your role in it? I don't remember reporting to directors about that. I don't know. Um, but I also feel whilst there's a, a number of bits of correspondence we've got here, I didn't have a... There's clearly some major correspondence here that refers to me in the Seema Misery case, but you've said me being having a major role in the case. Well, I, I didn't. I wasn't doing a lot to do with this case. I'd received a question, which is a really important question, which we've already talked about, but I wasn't actually doing anything. Um, I was continuing to be managing a back office finance team, settling with clients, um, and, and gearing up for Royal Mail privatisation and separation of post office functions. Um, and this case was going on, and I had these questions that came to me, but I wasn't somebody who was doing lots to do with the, uh, this, this case. And I say that because that would be true of any case. I wouldn't have been myself doing things to do with a case. Uh, can we turn on, please, to poll 304 4997? Can we look at the email at the foot of the page, please? Thank you. Um, it's an email from John L. Singh. You can see that it's rather strangely formatted in the top right-hand corner. Uh, yes, yep. Um, dated the 21st <coughs> of October at 2.58. Yep. To a long list of people, um, and amongst them is you. Uh, yep. The subject is um, the Crown and Seaman uh, Misra Guildford Crown Court trial attack on Horizon. And Mr. Son, uh, John L. Singh wrote, um, after a lengthy trial at Guildford Crown Court, the above name was found guilty of theft. This case turned from a relatively straightforward general deficiency case to an unprecedented attack on the Horizon system we were beset with an unparalleled degree of disclosure requests from the, uh, by the defense. Through hard work of everyone, Council Warwick Hatford, Investigation Officer John Longman, and through the considerable expertise of Gareth Jenkins of Fujitsu, we were able to destroy to the criminal standard of proof beyond reasonable doubt um, every single suggestion made by the defense. It's to be hoped the case will set a marker to dissuade other defendants from jumping on the horizon bashing bandwagon. You'll see the title to the email, um, Attack on Horizon. You'll see in the second line it refers to an attack on horizon and the claim made that the post office was able to destroy uh, the defense allegations. Is that language reflective of the culture prevalent at the time concerning Horizon? 
namely in response to a defendant who maintained a defense to the criminal charges of theft against her, was thereby seen as attacking Horizon, an attack which needed to be destroyed. I think that's un unpleasant language to be using. And Presumably you replied along those lines. I don't know. I'm, look I'm looking at that now and thinking that's unpleasant language. Um, I, I've no, I don't know what reply, if any, I made to that. So a defendant who uh, deigns to suggest that the computer system which is being used to convict her is said to ma be mounting an unprecedented attack on the system. Did you regard this as an inappropriately gleeful email? Well, I, I certainly do looking at it as, as we're here. I, I, I don't know what I thought at the time, but I'm looking at that thinking the subject title shouldn't even have words like attacking horizon in the subject of it. It should have simply been case title update. Um, and I think that's, that's not nice. That's unpleasant language to have used. The last sentence, it's to be hoped the case will set a marker to dissuade other defendants from jumping on the horizon bashing bandwagon. No doubt that was a sentiment with which you very much approved at the time. I'd been involved in collating that thing about the reasons to be assured about horizon. I would hope that I wasn't using language like horizon bashing. I was focused on reasons for integrity of the system. And clearly, there's a number of things that have come out that are contrary to the concept of integrity of it. But language like horizon bashing isn't really is unpleasant language to use again. But uh, this senior lawyer within the criminal law division has sent his email to uh, quite a number of the top slice of managers within the post office, hasn't he? Um, yes, yeah, some of the people in there are, um, yeah, senior executive team even, yeah. And wasn't that the culture of the time? If we get a win like this, we should weaponize it to dissuade anyone else from daring to suggest that there's anything wrong with Horizon? I, I don't sort of remember it as being a culture of weaponization, but there's certainly something you shared yesterday that was kind of a similar tone to it, and that's unpleasant. So I can see that as you lift a number of these bits of correspondence, it does not sound like an acceptable tone of voice. Do you know why Mr Singh would be concerned about the need to deter others? Um, no, um, Mr Singh, I think, would be, um, con should be concerned to have the right evidential objective process going through cases. Yes, I'm asking you whether you would know of any reason why a senior lawyer within post office's criminal right. law division um, uh, would um, express a wish, a hope, that the outcome of one case would deter others from making suggestions about um, the integrity of Horizon? No. Did you know that prosecutors in um, uh, civil, uh, in criminal cases, are uh, supposed to act as uh, ministers of justice, um, meaning that they don't secure a conviction at all costs, amongst other things? That's, that's not a, a phrase that I know, but it totally makes sense to me. So what you are saying, I would say, yes, I would agree with that. And that having a business-driven motive for securing a win in a criminal case would be inappropriate? Yes. Is that what was going on here? That there were business drivers here not wishing to let the outside world know that there were problems with the uh, horizons, uh, the, the integrity of horizons data, and that any opportunity 
to dissuade anyone from questioning the integrity of the system should be grabbed with both hands? Um, no, and I'll just add to that. So I think, no, it, it shouldn't, and I, and I would like to think that it wasn't being done in that way. But the organisation, yes, the post office, um, commercially would want it would want people to have got confidence in its point of sale system because all of its commercial clients and its customers and its sub postmasters and so many people have got different roles of a large part of the UK economic cash going through that organisation. So there'd be lots of reasons why people would want to be confident in the system. But when one gets down to the level of a specific case in a branch, as you've said, that should be done objectively. So there would be commercial reasons to want to be assured about the system, but I would hope and I would hope that it was actually being objectively done case by case. So, so, that, so my answer to that is, yes, there's commercial reasons, but I would hope that they didn't manifest themselves in the conduct of the case. Can we look, please, at poll 00113909? Thank you. And uh, if we just look at the foot of page one, please. Thank you. You'll see um, an email from Mandy Tolbert to, amongst other people, you. Uh, yeah, yeah. And we're going back four years here right. to 2006 and the Lee Castleton case. I right. just want to see whether this helps us in any way okay. yep. with the answers that you've just given. Yep. And so this is um, in the run-up to the trial. The Lee Castleton case commenced uh, its hearing in the High Court on the 6th of December 2006, and this is the 9th of November 2006, so it's about a month before. Yeah, yeah. You'll see that you're copied in. Yes. Uh, we're at the direct addressee. Um, what had the Lee Castleton case got to do with you? Well, I, I don't know at that time. In, I don't know what. So I must have left the invest. The I had the investigations team and branch audit team, but I think I'd. I think You've I'd moved went, on by now. I'd moved on by then, so I was in the product and branch accounting team. So what had the Castleton case got to do with me? Um, so I, I don't know whether we'd got to... Well, the, the, there was a... Uh, well, there's probably a debt was arising, an alleged debt arising at the start of this case that would have been something ultimately that either my current agent debt team or former agent debt team would have had a role in. Um, Mandy may have included me on it because she may have been used to including me on things in my previous role. So many people change jobs uh, so many times that sometimes people in who've moved on are still included on a previous address list. But my team would have had, um, I would expect my, my team, products and branch accounting, would probably have been asked at the um, branch audit to confirm if there were any um, transaction corrections pending at the time. So I imagine my team would have had a question asked to them in the um, conduct of uh, back at the branch audit stage, um, and that may have led to me being included on this. And if we um, go over uh, the page, please. Um, there's a blank page, sorry. And then scroll down, thank you. Um, I'm just going to um, give you some context here uh, by reading this. Um, our original claim against Castleton was in the region of £25,000. He entered a defence and counterclaim for £250,000, but of more concern brought the whole validity of the Horizon system into question. As a result, we've expended lots of legal costs to ensure the defence of those allegations is as perfect as possible. 
On Friday, Castle and Solicitors amended their defence counterclaim to reduce their counterclaim to £11,000. Last night, our barrister received a compromise offer from Castle and Solicitors, probably brought on by the fact they are obliged to serve their statements on Friday together with, where, with their accountant's report. We suspect that their accountant's report has not supported their claim. The bare offer is as follows. They offer the sum of £22,350 in settlement of our claim, our costs on the standard basis. Uh, they want us to agree to pay rent or get the temp to pay rent for the continued occupancy of Marine Drive. They want us to pay the wages of the assistant employed there. They want a letter of apology from us stating the proceedings were issued purely to recover a debt and there was no allegation of dishonesty. Um, she says, firstly, I think we can all agree demands three and four cannot be accepted, skipping over. Secondly, as we've never pleaded that Castleton was dishonest, there's no problem with us agreeing to this demand. We believe he's seeking to go back to work in the city and as such, a statement for us could be very valuable to him. Thirdly, the offer is defective in it, that it doesn't uh, mention interest. No offer has uh, been made to give a declaration to the effect that he withdraws all his allegations about the Horizon system. And then um, scrolling down, uh, we made a Part 36 offer to him in January, stating if he would pay our full claim, we wouldn't uh, seek our costs, which he rejected. He's now obliged to pay our costs on the indemnity, not the standard basis since that date. If costs are awarded on the standard basis, then traditionally the successful party would recover between 60 to 65 per cent of the costs expended. Any dispute is resolved in favour of the paying party. Costs on the indemnity basis means one recovers almost all of one's costs, and any dispute is resolved in favour of the receiving party. So there's quite a difference between the two. Sixthly, the reason for not uh, paying the full amount of the claim is spurious, as we've demonstrated to them a number of occasions that there is no basis for their allegation that the accounts were £3,509.18 pence short on week 49. Seventhly, the position in respect of costs is as not as clear-cut as it appears at first because the courts have an ability to cap the amount of costs awarded so as to make them proportionate to the size of the claim. However, they have to take a number of factors into consideration, not merely the size of the claim but the conduct of the parties. Ours has been impeccable. The importance of the issues to the parties, proportionality of the costs incurred to the size of the claim has, however, been emphasised in a recent Court of Appeal decision. There is, therefore, there is a risk that by rejecting an offer of our uh, standard costs, and then skip the blank page, the court could decide to cap the costs at, say, £60,000, and then award only 60% 60, uh, 60 of that. Cost to date, including the progress and the work which the accountants have done together with council's fees, come to approximately £140,000. The trial is still a little while off. I think we should aim for Castle to an agreeing judgment to be entered against him in the full amount plus an agreement that he will consent to the payment of a fixed sum in respect of cost. As a trade offer, a trade off, we can offer the letter confirming there was no dishonesty and agree uh, we will not seek interest at an indemnity level. The benefit of having a judgment against him in the full amount is we will be able to use this to demonstrate to the network that despite his allegations about Horizon, we were able to recover the full amount from him. It will be of tremendous use in convincing other postmasters to think twice about their allegations. That um, at last line of that, um, last two lines of that paragraph, the benefit of having a judgment is the post office will be able to use this to demonstrate things to the network and it will be of tremendous use in convincing other postmasters to think twice about their allegations. Does that reflect your understanding of the post office's approach to Mr. Castleton's case in general? It, it, it doesn't reflect my recollection of it. However, the language that's used in that, I would agree, is similar to the language that's in the thing that you showed me that's four or five years later and, and is um, not pleasant. It's again suggesting that the result from a single case can be weaponised, isn't it? Uh, yes. Postmasters, take note. Look what happens to you if you deign to take us on. That was the feeling, wasn't it? I, I, I don't recall that being the feeling, but clearly that, that is the, um, that is the 
a fair interpretation description of the sort of tone of, of those, those two lines that you've referred to, yeah. Can we go to poll 20113488? And if we um, look at the middle of page one, Thank you. We can see another email from uh, Mandy Tolbert uh, to John Cole, Mr. Baines, to you, yes, and to others. Yeah. Uh, Stephen Dilly has been approached by an insolvency practitioner instructed by Castleton. So this is post judgment now. Judgment's gone against Mr. Carlton. We're in um, February 2007. You can read his comments uh, uh, about yourself. Carlton has also agreed our total bill for costs in writing, which means we do not have to go to court to have them taxed, which incurs additional legal costs in its own right. This response also indicates that Carlton has no intention of appealing against the decision of the court and that the judgment is the final comment on the matter. As such, we will need to get on with making as much use of the judgment as possible. Uh, Stephen Dilley has asked for permission to publish an article in a legal journal about the case, which I have no objection to, as long as we maintain editorial control. As the more publicity the case is given, the greater should be its effect upon postmasters who take legal advice about defending claims for repayment. That's a further reflection of the post office's strategy here, isn't it? It, it, it does look like a similar tone. We've won. We need to hawk about the result that we've got as much as possible to discourage other postmasters from even thinking about taking us on. It's a similar tone to the other stuff, yeah. yeah. The more publicity the case is given, the greater the effect on postmasters. It's all of a piece, isn't it? And we see exactly the same repeated after the Seaman Misra case, don't we? Um, yes, the, the language that you've picked out of those is similar, yes, yeah. Can we move on, uh, please, that can come down. Uh, we can see from a, a series of documents that you um, attended a series of regular calls with lawyers from um, Bond Dickinson. If we can look at a couple of examples, please. Poll having back, gone backwards, I'm now going back to where we were in the chronology um, after um, the Seema Misra case, and we're now in 2013. Right. This seems to be a record made by the post office's solicitors, Bon Dickinson. It's headed regular call re-horizon issues, dated the 2nd of October 2013. Okay. Yeah. Uh, you can see the attendees, Roderick Williams, John L. Singh, both post office legal, and then Martin Smith of Cartwright King. Yes? Uh, yes, yes. Uh, you now in the Financial Services Centre, and then from security, Dave Posnett and Rob King. And then scroll down, please. nobody from communication, some people from networks, some people from informa information technology and change, and the Network Business Support Center. Yep. And then over the page, please. Um, previous issues identified and further action to be taken. And then there's a, a series of um, um, either post office branches or issues identified in the left-hand column, and then 
um, narrative against each of them. I'm not going to explore the content uh, uh, of any of them. If you just scroll on, please. And so it goes on. Yeah. Including civil cases and criminal cases and issues outside of um, litigation. Yeah. Just to take another um, example, please. Um, can we look at poll 304, 3371? In um, October 13, again, an attendance note by Bond um, uh, Dickinson. You can see the attendees and it's not dissimilar to before. Yep. And then scrolling down. Okay, thank you. It, you um, attended these um, series of meetings uh, with individuals from a variety of teams um, within uh, the post office, including post office legal, to discuss ongoing issues with Horizon. Is that right? Uh, uh, yes. Yep. When were these meetings established? I don't know when the start date of them was. What was the genesis of them? It was probably everything that we've been talking about. So I, I think around about that time, within products and branch accounting i think we were doing a back office efficiency program which has been referred to in a project ping was something in, in my earlier core bundle um, there were an, a number of things that we were doing which um, we were trying to do to make accounting transactions in branches simpler and more one touch stuff um, some of the things that were happening in branches in respect of deployment of new products and customer fraud, for example, attacks on ATMs and ATM retracts where people would get a £100 coming out and manage to do something with the notes, not the top or bottom note, but the middle of them. Um, there were a number of things that were going on um, that were affecting um, the um, kind of assurance about where is the cash helping to clarify with some postmasters things like ATM retract trays within the ATMs where somebody might think the money was missing but it was actually in a, in a tray underneath the machine because it had been retracted back into it. So I think there was quite an overlap between things that my team were doing around back office efficiency programme which was actually really front office product linked to back end and how do we make it easier to get the transaction going through in the first place. Those things um, sort of inherently overlapped with people perhaps complaining about how easy it was to transact a product and things, challenges about how easy it was to transact a product might lead to calls to the MBSC and sometimes those may um, rightly or inadvertently uh, become sounding like there were questions about Horizon when they may or may not have been and some of the other uh, things in the bundles have referred to some postmasters may for example speak directly to Wincor next door who oversaw the ATMs and, and you'd get a bit of a message from one to another that doesn't quite, that sort of evolves over time and then turns into something that says there's a horizon issue when actually it was a branch issue to do with another piece of kit. So I think, I don't know when this meeting started, but I think there was certainly an overlap between understanding how to make it easy to do some of the products, understanding how the commercial product pillars were uh, deploying new things um, through, through our network, um, and issues that were being uh, logged that would have directly perhaps fallen under the, um, the description of, of, of Horizon um, um, issues in here. So, so you're right, the, the topic list we've seen in that table covered some things that weren't um, perhaps a matter of the essence of the kind of challenges that this inquiry is directly looking at, but um, there was sort of quite an overlap of these different um, things coming together and so this group feels right there was a group that was 
convened, but I don't know when it started, but that, that's, well, I, I hope in some way that helps as my description of, of that's how my genesis of being involved in it comes about, I think. Were there terms of reference for this uh, group? Um, I, I don't know. I would expect there were, but I don't know. Was it a decision-making body? Um, was it a, I don't think it was a decision-making body. I think it was one that was going to um, make sure that with the different teams that were involved, that we were able to have a coordinated clarification of an issue. So, for example, I said about Wincornick stuff and ATMs and retrack trays within ATMs. There, there were a lot of situations where a call and a description of an issue may go directly to MBSC. Equally, sometimes branches have got direct yeah. telephone numbers into my team, so rather than ticketing it through the MBSC, they may have called somebody who they spoke to about a transaction correction the year before and called them on the off chance they could guide them to somebody. Um, sometimes people wrote letters into different people in the organisation. Sometimes things were raised through um, network relationship managers. Uh, and so where we were trying to ensure, for example, that we dealt with the ATM retract issue, we needed to make sure that we'd got some forum where all the different people who might have some knowledge of um, complaints being made and process improvements being identified, that they were coming together. So this group wasn't making a decision about something, but I think it was a forum where we could make sure that we got a consistent understanding um, of, of some of these topics. Possibly it should have been several different groups doing different things rather than having it all coming together. But I think at the time, because it was clear there were... Um, a, sometimes a blurring of, for understandable reasons, of somebody speaks to somebody who then speaks to somebody else who passes something on to somebody else. Sometimes there was some confusion about um, is, is, um, is a colleague in the network um, making an allegation about the Horizon system or is a colleague in the network raising a point about uh, something else that needs some sort of improvement around it but, but maybe nothing to do with the nature of the concerns that have led to this inquiry. To whom did this group report? Um, I, 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 don't, I don't know. I'm not sure if it did report to somebody. <coughs> I think that often you might have a group of, of people who meet to ensure that something is done. It, there are lots of groups who may gather who don't report to somebody because it's you've got together to fix something and you've worked out what needs doing and you get on with fixing it this obviously is a group that's touching on the horizon matters so um, I would have expected that there'd be visibility of this going into the legal director but I don't know just going back to page one, please. You'll see there's lots of lawyers involved. Uh, yes, yeah, yeah. Why was that? Well, I think because a lot of the, the point that I've made about the number of um, issues being experienced with products and bran in branches, a lot of those things were being raised in cases. So um, I think... Well, it does, it's a long list. I don't know why it needed five lawyers to be coming to the meeting. Who established this group of people? Um, don't know. Um, I don't know. <coughs> the, from a back office efficiency programme point of view, which was a programme that I was responsible for, I sometimes asked for groups to be convened together such that we could have a common understanding across network commercial um, marketing teams who've got the relationship with a corporate client, for example. So I, I would sometimes convene groups. I don't know whether I convene this one. I, I, I imagine that if I would have asked for something from a back office efficiency point of view, if, the, if Bond Dickinson are their letterheads on this, so I would think that this would have been this would have been initiated by somebody in legal. 
Thank you. So I'm about to move to um, a new set of topics. I wonder whether we could uh, take the morning break. We're going to comfortably finish um, today, and I would have thought before lunch. All right, that's fine. So what time should we start again? Um, maybe 20 past, please. Yeah, fine. Thank you. Uh, so good morning. Can you uh, see and hear me? Yes, I can. Thank you. Thank you, uh, thank you very much. I'm just going to move to the last topic that I'm going to ask you questions about on this occasion, Mr. Um, uh, Ismay. Okay. And it's about um, what you subsequently wrote about the payments and receipts mismatch bug. Right. And we're um, turning to a phase in February, March 2011, so about six months after writing the Horizon report, the documents suggest that um, you were involved in communications between Fujitsu and the post office relating to uh, the receipts and payments mismatch bug. Right. Well, you remember that, do you? Yes. Okay. Um, can we um, uh, look, please, to start with at Fujitsu 3081544? Sorry, it's 1545, my mistake. Thank you. Can we look at the second page, please? And it's the email in the middle of the page between um, Will Russell, who's described as a commercial advisor in service delivery. Was he somebody who worked um, for you at this stage? No, I think I think service delivery was a part of the um, IT and operations functions of the organisation. So no, he didn't report to me. No, I think he reported to Andy McLean actually. Who right. In any event, he says James. That's James Davidson to whom he's writing. Was that somebody who reported to you or was within your team? No, James Davidson, I, I think, was a Fujitsu person. Uh, he says, um, Dave Holbert is off, as you're no doubt aware. I need to make you aware of an issue that's bubbling away and is likely to escalate quite quickly. Saluwu and John, uh, Tony Jamaz, on our side, have been dealing with the receipts and payments issue that happened in September 2010. I'm not going to investigate with you whether or not that's correct, that the issue only happened in 2010, or whether it was evident in May or February 2010. I'll leave that to one side. The receipts and payments issue that happened in September 2010. There was a small team dealing with this, and it got to the point of resolution. However, given the current noise in the press over Horizon, Rod Ismay has picked up this issue and is concerned that there are still some unanswered questions around what happened in branches. Can I ask you to get involved, please, as I need to brief Mike on the implications of this issue so that we can check it against statements we've made previously. One of Rod's concerns was that this issue could be detrimental in how we approach future comms and cases pending. Firstly, was it right that by February 21 you had concerns about how the receipts and payments mismatch bug could affect pending cases? I think probably, yes. In what way did you were you concerned that the bug could affect cases pending? I can't remember exactly at the time, but I think I would have been um, thinking I've... I'd just collated a report that specified five topics, I think, in it back in August 2010, and this looks like the sixth topic. This wasn't one of them. Yeah. This wasn't one of them, yeah. So I think I would have been concerned that there's another topic arisen, and I think I would have been concerned, consistent with that 
report back in September that if something now has arisen that's got an impact on cases, well, what what, what does that mean? Um, and I think that, that would be a matter for the legal team to have decided what does that mean in respect of um, ongoing cases. But this thing, as some of the other... Um, the document that, that came up inadvertently, but you might move on to, it, it, it looks... And, and as I've looked at the evidence, it's helping remember what would have been going on at the time. But I looks like I tried to go through a scenario of, with these things happening, this is what I would have expected the accounts in a branch to show. However, what the accounts in the branch actually showed was this. And I think I got into correspondence with Gareth to say, well, what has happened here? How is one to the other? Um, so... So I think I would have been concerned because um, I've, I've got a role in accounting um, and there's something here and that, 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 didn't, that didn't make sense. Um, and I think clearly in, in this, the report I collated refers to things like double entry bookkeeping. Um, some, some aspect of, of the um, um, matters that have come out of this have raised the question about that kind of core concept and I think there was an element of this in here that was well how, how, is, that, how is that bookkeeping working through this process uh, and, and therefore um, frankly I think there was hardly anybody else in the organisation who could talk double entry bookkeeping in that way so I was trying to um, marshal that conversation with, with, with Gareth and I think the email that you're referring to yeah. um, is Fujitsu 30815544. If we just display that. Yes, yeah. yes. Yeah, yeah. At the foot of the page, we see a series of questions that you address to Gareth Jenkins and others. Right, yep. but principally addressed to Gareth Jenkins and the questions continue on this page it doesn't show up well in the non-colour version but he provides his answers underneath each right. question Right. overall what did you take from his replies um, I can't remember what I took from it um, did it cause you to revisit anything that you had written in your report um, I don't think it did I mean, I, I, don't think, I don't think I reissued the report that I'd done. I didn't. The report stood. Um, so I've, I have tried to get my head back into the space where I was to understand this. I've got about 3,500 pages of documents I've been working through um, to try to get... And I have tried to put my head back into the thought process I've got here. And evidently, I'd got into some really detailed setup of here's a number of things a starting point here's a transaction gets us to there this is what it should have been this is what it actually was how's the bookkeeping working through there um, I haven't managed amongst all those three and a half thousand pages to get my head back into the space exactly on, on this one so I'm, I don't know what I made of Gareth's reply that came back I honestly can't remember whether I was assured or, or, or not out of it but I think my general sense of my um, when I did have conversation with Gareth about stuff and with other colleagues at Fujitsu, I, perhaps wrongly, um, but I felt I was having a um, conversation where I felt the individuals and Gareth included um, knew what they were talking about and presented a cogent analysis that made sense to me, um, which was part of a, a reason for me um, feeling assured about, about what he was saying. So I, I don't know what my summary interpretation was of this um, specific thing. Um, but maybe we'll come to something that does indicate what my thoughts were. I'm not sure what other documents follow on from this. Thank you. That can come down. As a general question, to end my questions, right. um, is there um, uh, any reflection that you have got that you would like to give on your role, particularly in 2010, concerning this episode? Um, well, I think in, res in 2010, in respect of the uh, report that I've collated 
and I've, I've put in my witness statement reflections that I've got on that. I think it could have been done differently, different tone of voice, could have had a um, terms of reference agreed about it, and I've indicated this morning that you know, there's a question of this was a, a report being collated about reasons about um, the reasons to be assured about an IT system. So why was it me that was being asked to, to, to collate the thing? So I think there's a number of things that I've perhaps stepped back and say, well, in hindsight, I would have perhaps challenged who's the owner of this system within the organisation and where are they coming to the table to articulate um, and, and collate this thing. Thank you very much. They're the only questions I ask for now. Thank right, you. thank you. And I think Mr Steen is first, sir. Yep. Mr Ismay, my name is Sam Steen. I represent uh, a large number of sub-postmasters and mistresses, and I'm instructed by a firm of solicitors called Howe & Co. Okay. Mr Ismay, um, I'm just going to remind you of the, uh, the dates, or the date in particular, of your system integrity report. Uh, that was obviously in 2010, in the very early part of August 2010. Do you remember that? Yes, yes. And you will also recall, no doubt, the questions that have been asked by um, Mr. Beer King's counsel uh, yesterday regarding your um, system integrity report. I know he asked a lot of questions. He did. And the overall uh, result of your report was, it seems, to give the Horizon system a, um, a clean bill of health. You thought it worked okay. Is that fair? Yeah, I thought there was a long list of reasons to be assured, um, including um, avenues where um, colleagues and branches could escalate issues if they'd got them, um, rather than it coming to light in a response to a, a case. So, so in, other, in other words, Mr. Ferriswey, you, you are saying in that report that uh, what you're putting forward there is that the system seems to be okay. Yes. Yes. Now, um, you've just been asked some questions about the receipts uh, payments mismatch yeah. issue, yeah. okay? I'm going to take you to a document, and Lawrence, I think you have the reference. It's P-O-L-000-28838. Thank you. Now, um, this document, as you can see at the top, if we just look at the top of the screen, you can see left-hand side post office, yeah. right-hand side Fujitsu, Right smack in the middle, there is receipts, payments, mismatch, issue, notes, okay? Yep. All right. So then let's have a look at the attendees, because it's clearly referring to a meeting. All right? Yep. Um, let's go through these uh, attendees. Antonio Jamash, AJ in brackets, service delivery. Someone you know? Uh, yes. Okay. Within Pole? Um, within, yes, I think in, in service delivery, that was part of post office IT, I think, yeah. Emma Langfield? Uh, remember the name? Um, yeah, um, yeah. Again, within Pol IT. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. yeah. Yes. We can see they're referred to as service delivery. Alan Simpson, security. Uh, yes, I think information security. Yeah. Information security. Um, yeah, I think so. Right. Quite senior. Uh, uh, I think he was as a manager in the team. I don't know what yeah. level his role. Julia was. Marwood. Um, yeah, I remember Julia over rolling network. Again, Pol. Uh, Pol. Yes. yes. Yep. Yeah. And then Ian Trundle rather helpfully described uh, there as IT, IT presumably his initials, and also IT <laughs> expertise. Is that fair? Uh, yes. Okay. Yeah. Andrew Wynn, of course you know, Paul Not Finer. My team, yes. yes. Yep. Uh, Mike Stewart, uh, Fujitsu STM, John Simpkin, Simpkins, Fujitsu Security, Gareth Jenkins, Fujitsu Technical, and Mark Wright, Fujitsu Technical. Okay. So we can see that this particular document has got a real joined together uh, sense. We've got both post office, Fujitsu, looking at the receipts, payments, mismatch issue. Yeah. Do you agree? Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. Now, if you, you've explained to Mr. Birkin's counsel that you were aware of this particular issue um, in uh, at least as we were looking at the documents by the time you reached the early part of the following year, 2011. Yeah. Right. Now, help us, please, with... When did you when do you remember first being made aware of this issue? Was it in 2010 or was it later? I'm not sure when I came aware of it. The 
there's a lot of stuff in here that's prompting my memory to recall things. And it, it looks like I was on holiday in February and came back to get involved in something. I think the bit of correspondence we saw that was dated 18th of February maybe was before the half term. So maybe I, maybe I saw something earlier in February. Um, but um, to the best of my knowledge, it'll be February. I, I, I can't remember. I okay. Uh, let's have a, um, a little bit of um, thinking about the system integrity report. Yeah. Um, that report, was that circulated amongst um, poll uh, senior team membership, amongst managers? How far did that circulation reach? So, the, so I shared it with the uh, senior managers within yeah. my team um, in the collation of that report, and that is a thing that probably in hindsight they should have been added to the circulation list for clarity. So the, that report, I shared it with the group who were named on that report. I shared it with the five or six people who directly reported to me, because in the compilation of talking to people, then some of my own team were some people who I spoke to to gather some of the information that went into that. To the best of my knowledge, that's the audience that I shared that report with. So that had reasonably good distribution amongst poll? Well, it had the, um, well, 15 people on that one and then five or six people who reported to me. Yeah, OK. Now, let's... Uh stay with dates for the moment and in relation to the document we have on the screen um, the pages that we have one to five are not dated but if we go to um, the uh, sixth page within the bundle Lawrence um, we can see that's title top right hand corner appendix two to CS's responsive note so it would be the sixth page on relativity Correcting accounts lost discrepancies. And then, Lawrence, if you can go right to the bottom of the page, and if it's possible to expand that and highlight at the bottom, we'll see then some help on dates. Very great. Now, um, is it possible to get rid of that uh, little inset box on, that's currently on the screen that says desktop, UMV, et cetera? It's only my screen, right? <laughs> right. Apparently, it's only my screen, so that's uh, uh, that's helpful. Let's let's read through what, in fact, you have on the screen. You've got right at the bottom, c colon for uh, backslash documents and settings backslash Janelle dot sing, and then variety of other things. And underneath that, you've got then printed at sixteen thirty eight twenty four on eighth of October two thousand and ten. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Right. Yeah. So we we can. With that, and if we go back a page, please, Lawrence, um, to some action point summaries, we can see some dates that help us a bit more uh, in relation to when things are happening. So if we right. go back a page, so that's page five or five. Uh, there we are. And so uh, we can see, Mr. Resume, that we've got a little bit more help here on dates, despite the fact the document itself isn't dated. Yeah. We, we can see that we're talking about dates that relate to uh, the 6th, uh, 8th of October, and then the other date we looked at for the back document yes. is the 10th. Okay, yes. all right. Yep. So we can see we're talking about, um, I suppose, the first week or so of, of October. Yeah. All right, 2010. Now, back to page one. So that's page one of POL 0028838. Please, Lawrence. And that document uh, uh, sets out there under the heading, what is the issue? Yep. And if we just go through that, uh, it explains slightly better over the page, so we'll just have a look at that in a moment. What is the issue? Discrepancies showing at the horizon counter disappear when the branch follows certain process steps, but will still show within the back-end branch account. And then it's currently impacting circa 40 branches uh, since migration onto Horizon Online, uh, overall cash value of circa 20k loss um, and then this issue will only occur if a branch cancels the completion of the trading period but within the same session continues to roll into a new balance period okay yeah. all right now this then is explained a little bit better if we go over the page all right so let's go to page two of five using the internal document pagination And we should have at the top of your page there, it says, um, does it start with note at this point, nothing into feeds Pulse app? 
You have that? Yes. Right, okay, let's read through that. Note at this point, nothing interfedes Pulsat and Credence. So in effect, the Pulsat and Credence shows the discrepancy, whereas the horizon system in the branch doesn't. So the branch will then believe they're balanced, okay? Middle of that page, under the second note, it says, note, the branch will not get a prompt from the system to say there is a receipts and payment mismatch. Therefore, the branch will believe they have balanced correctly. All right? Yep. Um, and lastly, just on, the, on what happens, what's the consequence of the issue, impact, further down that page, first bullet point, the branch has appeared to have balance, whereas in fact they could have a loss or a gain. Okay? Yes. Right. Yep. Um, this, this appears to represent a, a problem to double entry book ca uh, keeping. Do you agree? Yes. Right. The, the point being, your background training as an accountant is that essentially what you should be able to find within the branch should match the rest of the system. Do yes. you agree? Yes. Right. Now, th this doesn't appear to say that the system's um, working properly, or indeed is fine and dandy, does it, Mr. No, Ismay? it doesn't. No. Now, you were asked a number of questions by Mr. Beer, um, King's Counsel, about this particular issue. Uh, did you have the understanding of this particular issue that you and I have just looked at over the last few minutes at the early part of 2011? I must have, because yes. I've dated something 18th of February, so I certainly did then. Why, Mr. Ismay, did you not amend your report from August 2010, when you knew, at least from this particular mismatch bug issue, that in fact this was not a system that operated properly at all times? So I don't know why I didn't redo that report. The report had just been asked for as a one-off at the time, and I provided that. You'll have seen some of the audience um, in those emails there were, one of them was a direct addressee of the original report. Um, and so clearly some of that audience were also aware of this thing because they'd been corresponded about it while I was on holiday. So Why I, was a I'd, I'd got lots of things that I was involved in, and um, the concept with all the things that I was involved in gearing up to run my privatisation, they, they thought, and this I appreciate, this is unsatisfactory in the nature and gravitas of the whole of events that have, have gone on. But um, thinking of rewriting and reissuing the report that I'd done the previous year, I don't think it crossed my mind at the time because I was incredibly busy with many other things. Now, clearly, that is in the context of what's happened. Um, it does beg a question of, well, should I have um, redone that report? And in hindsight, it, 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 I probably should have, but I didn't. Mr. Ismay, your background, as you describe in the statement that you give, is that... Uh you uh, joined the post office in September 2003 as head of risk and control in the finance directorate. Yes, yeah. Previously worked for a, a company that's well known called Ernest & Young. You consider yourself to be a finance professional with a background in audit accounting and, a pos and positive experience of board reporting, staff engagement and process improvement. How would you rate your own performance in relation to not amending that report, Mr. Rizmet? I think on this one, that's a failure. Yeah. I think there are many other things that I did that were not, and I got a lot of feedback that there were a lot of positive reports and positive process leadership that I did, but on this specific one, it's clear that that was unsatisfactory. And so the upshot was that you left a report that gave the system a clean bill of health, essentially un unupdated within the poll system as being a general report that said that everything's fine and dandy with the Horizon system. You just left it unaltered. That's what you did, didn't it, Mr. isn't it, Mr. Ismay? I, as I've explained earlier, was asked to collate a report, which begs the question to me of why wasn't somebody in IT who owns this system asked to collate that report in the first place. 
Um, members of IT were talking about that thing while I was on holiday in February. Um, members of IT should have been responding to the, 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 the issue of what was, what, 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 how did this add to it. Yes, as a professional, I had issued a report and that begs the question of should I have reissued that? Well, I'm not sure it should have been me writing the report in the first place. Uh, and as I've put in the end of my witness statement, I've suggested that there should be clearer ownership of systems in order that the relevant individuals can escalate people, things to the right place and ensure that there's resolution by the owner of the appropriate system, which was not me. Did you check whether, as you've just said, the members of IT were adequately responding to this particular issue so, so that you could then take that into account in relation to your report? Did you check whether anything was being done? I, I would have asked for get on and sort this. I'm going to ask you to go back then to the document, which is POL. We've had it on the screen, I think, still now. 28838, page 2 of 5. It's on the screen. I'm very grateful. Under impact, look at the bottom part. We've looked at the first bullet point. And it says this, that in relation to this issue, Second bullet point, this is, our accounting systems will be out of sync with what is recorded at the branch. Third bullet point, if widely known, could cause a loss of confidence in the horizon system by branches. Fourth bullet point, potential impact upon ongoing legal cases where branches are disputing the integrity of horizon data. Point, uh, the fourth, and sorry, the fifth and last of those five bullet points. It could provide branches ammunition to blame horizon for future discrepancies. Do you agree that those are the same types of sentiments as you've examined with Mr. Beer, King's Council? In I, relation agree, to I agree that those sound like the same types of sentiments, yes. Excuse me, one moment, Mr. Rizman. Nothing further, Mr. Rizman. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Rizman, um, while it's on my mind, on a number of occasions now, you have used a phrase like it begs the question in respect of why it was you that was chosen to write the report in August 2010. I just want to be clear what the implication of that is. Are you suggesting that Mr. Smith had an ulterior motive in inviting you to make that report? No, I'm, I'm not suggesting that he had an ulterior motive, but I'm wondering why somebody in IT who owned the system wasn't asked to, because they would have been more readily able to immediately come up with some sections of that report. Well, that might be a fair point, which is why I ask you the question whether you could, um, if you can, offer any kind of explanation as to why it was you that was chosen. Well, I, I think that I was chosen because Dave was relatively new in the organisation. I think he was only in post office for a year. Um, I, I don't know when he joined, but he would have probably, with the, the, the diversity organisation, would still have been learning about a number of things. I, I know that he came to Chesterfield, um, and I and my team had um, explained to him the nature of the functions that we did in Chesterfield. Um, which had a large contact with um, with some postmasters and post office branches. So I think that Dave would have um, um, interpreted out of that that I had got an understanding um, that possibly felt more from the conversations he was having than than with other teams that he'd had an induction with. Um, so I, I and, and so and that that's. That's why I think he asked me. All right. Thank you. Yes, who's next, please? Flora Page, sir. On yeah. behalf of a number of the other sub-postmasters, Mr. Ismay. Did you speak to any other potential witnesses before giving your evidence to the inquiry about your evidence? No. So it, I've not spoken to any other witnesses in the course of any things that have had to do with the inquiry, no. Uh, Mr. Beer King's counsel took you to an email 
yesterday that Lynn Hobbs apparently sent to you in which she told you that Fujitsu could insert transactions into branch accounts. Do you remember that? Email? I do remember that document, yes. I remember it from the pack yesterday, yeah. Well, that was what I was going to say. You received that, of course, prior to coming yesterday, didn't you? Yes, so that would have been in one of the bundles that I received, yes. And so you will have seen when you read it that it was also sent to Angela Vanden Bogard, um, although not at the same time as it was sent to you, it was sent to her subsequently. Did right. you notice that? Well, I can't remember who, whose names were on the thing, but if that's, I'm not disagreeing with you, if that's, uh, yeah, yeah. All right, well, bear with me. It was sent to her at the same time as your report was sent to her your report to um, the managing director, David Smith, in which you said that there were no back doors into the Horizon system and that branch accounts could not be changed in any way by anyone other than those in the branch. Right. Yes? Yeah. So she received the two contradictory documents at the same time. On the one hand, an email from Lynn Hobbs saying that Fujitsu could insert transactions and on the other hand, your report saying that they could not. Right, okay. So when you read that in advance of these hearings, did you think of speaking to Miss Vanden Bogard about the Hobbs email? No. To see what she remembered of it? No. I've consciously not um, spoken to anybody um, back at the post office, and I don't know anybody at Fujitsu either, so I've not spoken to other people, and I've been as keen as possible in the nicest way to avoid reading things in the press and on social media as much as possible in order to come here with as uncontaminated a recollection as I can to, to have this conversation. So, and I, I certainly have not. And now I would say, going back um, a few years, I have been contacted by Post Office Limited um, to... Um, with a question of could I help to collate an understanding of what happened many years ago. So with one firm of solicitors acting for the post office, I was approached um, a few years ago after leaving the post office to provide something. Angela, I think, texted me to say, would I mind speaking to the solicitors? But that's the only um, contact I've had. All right, so we're to understand that you simply haven't asked her about what she may remember or whether she spoke to you at the time about it? No, I, and I, I think my perception for this inquiry is that it's more appropriate that I come into the room uncontaminated by what other people's thoughts are. The inquiry's presented me with things to try to jog my memory of what happened all those years ago. I've, I have not, and I feel it would have probably been inappropriate to be having a discussion with other potential witnesses. So, so no, so I, I haven't, no. And the same then must be true also of Mike Granville, who received that email at the same time as you. That, that's, that's correct. So I probably haven't, I don't want, well, I haven't spoken to Mike Granville since I left the post office. No. It's interesting to note that we um, don't have that email from Lynn Hobbs to you and Mike Granville in the form that it was originally sent. You saw that, didn't you? It was, um, it was in the format of apparently that email having been cut and paste into another email from Miss Hobbs to John Breeden. Did you notice that? Yes, I, I did notice that, yeah, yeah. So what we don't have is the email as it would have appeared in yours and Mike Granville's inbox. Yeah, or, or did it even go into my inbox? So I, I don't know what emails I received back then. Probably like you, I do find it slightly odd. But I would also expect the, I don't know the process by which the inquiry has been able to obtain all the different documents that are fed into these bundles. It sort of feels like you must have had access to email uh, accounts or, or something to collate this. So um, I, I am somewhat puzzled for what appears to be an important document, why it is a cut and paste. I, uh, that, that, that seems uh, slightly odd. Yes. Because we all know, don't we, that emails would also not only be in your inbox, but presumably in her outbox, her sent items. Uh, yes? Um, yes, yes, yeah. And, uh, and presumably also in Mike Granville's inbox, yes? Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, so we don't have it from any of those sources. 
although it must have been available to Miss Hobbs when she cut and pasted it in the, D, in the, uh, in the month that she cut and pasted it. Yes, so she must have had it in her sent items at that point, mustn't she? Well, yeah, presumably it was either an email that was in sent items, which is most likely the case, or one could type it and paste what you want. So do you know anything about why the original email is apparently no longer in existence? No. Were you ever aware of your colleagues in security destroying documents? No. I, am, I have read in the press subsequently, like in the last couple of years, comments about um, individuals and shredding, but I wasn't aware at the time that I was at the post office. Of Not when you were in charge of those in investigations either? No. So there was a period, wasn't there, when Mr Rotting was reporting to you and you were in effect the boss of investigations, yes? Yeah, so probably in 2005, yeah, yeah. And uh, you've told us that you haven't listened to the human impact evidence. Um, you'll forgive me if I put some to you because it relates to the conduct of the investigators. But yeah, and could, could I just clarify the reason that I haven't listened to the human impact, and, and, it, and it's awful. I know that the content of that will be really up to awful for the individual concerned and difficult to, to share that. That goes back to the concept again of me wanting to be able to attend this inquiry with as uncontaminated a, a history in my own head of what do I remember because the nature of the inquiry is I am sat here having seen some things in the press. I've had people on Twitter saying things about me which you hear so many things and eventually you think well can I remember that or yeah, I've heard this so many times did I hear that or, or not? And, and therefore, I've, I've tried to take the approach, and I, and I don't want that to sound insensitive, but I've tried to take the approach as much as possible of not listening to the, the commentary, in, including those, those um, uh, phase one of this inquiry. And that's really because I received a letter that said I was going to be invited into inquiry. I thought, right, I, I want to be able to come here and give my own memory of it. And that's, that's not in any disrespect to the individuals who will have found it hard to share that. I didn't, I didn't want to come here with a possibility of what they've said contaminating my recollection uh, of, of what I'm um, sharing with you. Why did Andrew Wynne's testimony fall into a different category to the human impact testimony in that case? Because Andy Wynne worked for me and there were specifically that felt appropriate to look All the more reason why his recollections may have contaminated yours. Well, no? uh, okay, yep, yep. Could I have, please, um, INQ 401035, please? I think, could, could I just also add to that that as an attendee coming in as a witness, I did think it was important to me to have an understanding of how a witness session um, is conducted. And so I have watched Andy Wins, and that's helped me partly to understand the context of the environment to which I will be coming in. Could we go down, please, to page four? And I'm trying to find the um, internal numbering, page 14. we zoom in on page 14? Thank you very much. And if we pick up at line 22, this is um, her, Tracy Felsted, giving an account of being interviewed by post office investigators. Right. And this is, uh, the questions are obviously coming at this stage from counsel to the inquiry. All right, so then Q and then A. So I'll just read through some of the Q and A, please. What did they ask you and what did you say? They asked me where the money had gone, what I'd done with the money, 
Never at any stage was it, what do you think has happened? Was there any reason for this to happen? It was very much I was being asked constantly, what have I done with the money? Where has the money gone? I was being accused from day dot. And then, um, if we go please to page 17, um, internal numbering. Line 22 again. So, sorry, just above line 22. I'm sorry, I've got the wrong line number there. So you were being asked to prove how you had not committed a crime. And the answer was yes. It was, is that how the interview went? Yes, yes, very much so. They had access to my bank accounts. They had access to my home. They never, ever came to my home or searched my home, but they looked through all my bank accounts. There was no money to find because there was no money there. Um, so this was uh, in 2001, so it was before your time. Thank you, that can come down. But we can see there, can't we, that the way that the investigation went, the way that the investigators conducted it, was on the assumption that there was fault. There was not a, 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 an impartial or open questioning. It was almost a reversal of the burden of proof from the start, wasn't it? Uh, that's, uh, yes. Yeah? yeah? That's what we see there. Yeah. And um, you've told us about how you knew that passwords and user IDs were shared and not necessarily used as they should have been to identify who was doing what. Yeah. And that was actually what was going on in Tracy Felstead's case. That was the defense that she put forward. So plainly, she had a defense, one that in fact you knew about. What did you do to make sure that investigators approached these cases, knowing that there were possibly reasons why people were not responsible for thefts when Horizon said there was money missing. What did you do to make sure investigators knew that? I don't know what I did to ensure objectivity. That doesn't sound objective. I'm, I'm agreeing with the, the point that you're raising. I don't know what I did to, to do that. Well, you were the one who was in charge of investigators. Um, did you think it was your job to make sure that investigators were objective? I would like to think that I did. I think... But you don't know what you did to put that into effect? No, I'm, I'm, I probably didn't put anything into effect. And let me just expand on that. So the, the conduct of a case, the investigators reported to me rightly or wrongly, most of my focus with the investigations team, when security was split in two from physical security to investigations, I was given the investigations team primarily because there was felt to be a linkage between audit risk modelling that the audit team did and the fraud risk modelling that the fraud risk team did. And therefore the two teams came together, rightly or wrongly, my focus during that was about the data that was enabling the targetry through the risk modelling the relationship between the investigators was very much that a case was compiled and was presented to the criminal law team and there was an oversight of that by the criminal law team. So I was the head of a team that had the investigations team in it, but I was not qualified of an investigations background, but I felt assured that there's a relationship between the criminal law team and the investigators <laughs> that was overseeing the way in which case files were compiled. Well, let's just look at the document that Mr. Beer, King's counsel, took you to. It was significantly after your time, but appears to have been the only document we can find which deals with the way investigations were carried out. Right. So that's poll 303-8853. And... 
And if we can go down to page 25, please. If we zoom in on 519.10, paragraph 519.10, This comes after a, a series of paragraphs explaining the way that um, the decision-making process for when to charge somebody comes about. And this is the sort of culmination of it. And it says that the post office legal and compliance team then goes to head of security. You see that sort of arrow that's being used in these paragraphs as a way to suggest that the decision moves from this team to that team. Okay. So this final decision goes from post office legal and compliance to head of security. The file is then forwarded to the designated prosecution authority, brackets DPA, for authority to proceed. The DPA will review the case file and decide whether to proceed with the advice from the poll CT, that's the poll legal and compliance team, and Cartwright King, or whether to take a different course of action. The authority to proceed or other instruction will be inserted into the case file. So in other words, quite clearly, it was head of security that took the final decision on whether to charge someone, not the legal and compliance team. Well, it wasn't coming to me as a decision, so when I was head of risk and control, including the investigations team, things weren't coming to me to say, Rod, what do you decide about this? things were being, a case was compiled um, and there was a relationship into the criminal law team on that and I think the criminal law team would if necessary have had conversations I think with the um, um, uh, director of public prosecutions area um, and the um, approach was through them it was not to me to say Rod um, do you approve of this? No. Thank you. Um, the document can come down. So your uh, evidence is that sometime after your time, there was a process change which meant that the final decision lay with head of security rather than legal? Yeah. yeah. All right. Um, can we please look at a um, document which you have looked at, but I'd like to just look at some other parts of it, if, if I may, please. It's um, in document number poll 3090437. And we're going down to page 86 of this rather long document. Um, this, this is, uh, if we could also just have a quick look at page 87, which I think we've, is the one we've actually looked at before. Um, do you remember you, you saw this email in which Mr. Utting was sort of making a, a pitch, if you like, for uh, yes, yep. the work of doing civil investigations? Yes, yeah. And at this time you were still his boss, yes? Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, I just wondered if you recognise the handwriting at the top of that email or on the preceding page? No. Um, no. If, we, if we zoom in a bit on that uh, handwritten page and see if we can make out uh, what some of it says. There is um, a need to work up a business case to obtain additional resource, possibly from Chesterfield. Um, I'm just trying to see on the page where I got that from. Oh, yes, I think it's paragraph one there. Can you just about see that? Issues with civil litigation cases need a business case to be worked up to get additional resource could come from Chesterfield. And then there's a mention, apparently, of Dave Holbert. Is that ringing any bells with you? 
Um, that, I, I can't remember this document, but the kind of theme of what's in it rings a bell with me, in that I think we were, as we saw yesterday, going through headcount reduction exercises regularly. And I think certainly the concept of if something, if, if something new needed resourcing up, given that there was a headcount reduction target in another area, but perhaps another, a, a, a need for resource somewhere else, it might have been that somebody could have been redeployed out of a Chesterfield team to work on something else. So the idea of it doesn't seem unreasonable to me that if the security team or the investigations team was looking for some resource, then maybe some resource would have come out of a restructuring in Chesterfield. That makes sense. I don't remember this thing, but that, that would make sense to me. Does um, it, does Dave, it Dave Hulbert's Sorry. in IT. Dave, so whether, whether in IT they would have had resource, I don't know. Does it suggest any kind of a link between Chesterfield and security? Um, it's, well, it, I think that, I mean, there is a link because the, the nature of what security might have been looking for somebody um, to do with um, data gathering and given that a, a, a number of pieces of data that would feed into security risk modeling were data that were coming from Chesterfield, then there absolutely was a kind of an almost resource in Chesterfield who would have an element of experience that would give them the capability to help another team. So um, that there was a natural um, knowledge opportunity that, that, that there would be a linkage there, yeah. Was there a sense in which security was sort of running parts of the business, legal, Chesterfield, security in charge? Um, no, I don't think so. I think it was a, a thing that those teams would have been speaking to each other during the course of things, and the, um, there was a sort of some common skills between those areas or common um, process understandings that, and, and, and common... Um, the Chesterfield teams and the security teams would both have had an understanding of product transactions in branches and therefore somebody going either way between the two teams could... Um, help the other team by hitting the ground running with some standing knowledge of processes. Can I pick on another point on the next page, um, third paragraph of the email that we looked at yesterday? In the um, paragraph beginning, because... Uh, Mr. Rutting says this as part of his pitch. Because we also have strong ties with the security and audit function within Fujitsu, we are also able to take witness statements from them in support of prosecution cases and could use the same links in support of civil matters. And then he says in brackets, indeed, the standard statements that they currently provide to us in prosecution cases were originally drafted with support from our team. Um, do you know anything about that, with them providing standard form statements to Fujitsu? Um, I, I, I don't, but I am aware that um, where there are, often an organisation will ask another organisation about templates of stuff. In my current job, I speak to peers in other organisations and we discuss templates of things because why recreate the wheel if somebody's got the kind of eight headings that are a structure for something? So the idea that they may have compared a template between the two makes sense to me. I don't recall the conversation, but it makes sense to me that they may have discussed the template. So you weren't involved in Mr Utting helping Fujitsu to draft their templates? No, 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 I wasn't. And, and, and let me be clear about the word template in there. A template is a structure of something. It is not the content related to a particular case. So it would make sense to me that two organisations might speak to each other about does a document have an executive summary, an index, um, a, an author's page. That is the sort of template that I'm talking about. Do you know whether Mr Utting gave any thought or... Did you give any thought to the possibility that these might be used by, quotes, expert witnesses and the sort of format that an expert witness ought to use? Um, 
well, I, I, I don't think I did, but I would have. I would think that that, that Tony may have had um, experience of working with expert witnesses, and if there was some knowledge of what does an expert witness do, then then quite that may have informed something about a template. As I say, that is about a template, not about case-specific uh, content. All right, well, let's move on to case-specific content in the case of Mr Castleton. Um, could I have, please, document number poll 7426? Um, and if we just have a look at the date first. This is uh, the November of the previous year to the one we were looking at, and um, so it's 2005, so presumably you're still in investigations at this stage, yes? Um, or you're yeah. part, you're, you're leading investigations? Uh, yeah, yeah. And um, if we just scroll down a bit, and sort of come up from the bottom as we do with email chains. I think I'm right in saying. I think it may be one of these ones which has blank pages, so. Yes, if we just pause here, please, and go back and just have a look at who that was sent to, which includes you. So it comes from Mandy Talbot, and it goes to David X. Smith, and I think we're all clear that that's the head of IT rather than the much later MD David Smith. Yes, that's correct. Uh, Jennifer Robson, uh, Tony R. Utting, and you, as well as some other copies in. And so this is Mandy Talbot describing a little bit of background on the Castleton case and what um, has happened so far. Proceedings have been issued by Paul against Lee Castleton, the former postmaster at Marine Drive, for 27,000. It was known by the business prior to the issue uh, that Lee Castleton blamed Horizon for the losses. External solicitors were asked to check with the Fujitsu liaison team and to assure themselves that the evidence in respect for Horizon was sound before the issue of proceedings. There had been no security investigation, so the data had not been requested from Fujitsu. Proceedings were issued and a defence and counterclaim for losses flowing. Um, she then goes on to describe how the court ordered a stay and that there were some uh, mistakes made and a judgment in default uh, was filed by Mr Castleton. So I'm just sort of summarising a bit here. She describes how there was a short hearing um, and as a result the judgment in default uh, was set aside. So if we go down to the next paragraph. As part of the claim, the solicitors for Lee Castleton have stated in the allocation questionnaire that they intend to call evidence from other existing and former postmasters about the problems with the Horizon system. They have also asked for disclosure of data about all calls or complaints logged from postmasters about the Horizon system presumably from the inception of the system. They have called for disclosure of all documents removed from the branch office during the investigation. There is an issue over locating all these documents. All right, so solicitors acting for Mr. Castleton had asked for very significant disclosure of problems with Horizon, yes? Yes. If we go down, um, she sets out how another case that involving a Mr. Bajaj uh, was also challenging the validity of data supplied by the Horizon system. Um, and then if we carry on down and pass the blank page, she talks about there being other postmasters potentially in a similar situation. His solicitors say that they have been contacted by other postmasters and that a class action is possible unless the deductions from remuneration are refunded. They also make a reference to what we assume is the Castleton case. 
She talks about issues. In each case, the postmasters are challenging the validity of data provided by the Horizon system. And the cases became litigious before that evidence could be properly investigated. In each case, it was known that Horizon was going to be challenged, but there was no procedure in place to A, acquire the necessary data, B, identify somebody with the relevant knowledge and capacity to interpret the data and report on the same. If the challenge is not met, the ability of Poll to rely on Horizon for data will be compromised and the future prosperity of the network compromised. Fujitsu's reputation will be affected. She goes on to make suggestions. A robust procedure is set up and communicated to all relevant parties for extracting necessary data from Horizon at an early stage in all cases, leading towards possible termination of contract in each case where the Horizon data is challenged. Two, this will necessitate expenditure by Paul in identifying a small team and training them in interpretation and investigation techniques. Three, Fujitsu and Paul to liaison identifying a number of individuals or specialist computer firms who could provide a professional and independent report upon the Horizon system in general and in the two cases to hand if necessary. Four, Paul stroke Fujitsu investigate and identify whether or not they do hold any data upon the number of complaints made by postmasters about the Horizon system since inception and whether or not it can be broken down into statistics about valid problems, stroke resolutions, stroke errors by postmasters. Five, identify current members of Poll or Fujitsu staff who can provide statements in the two current cases, which A, validate the system, B, explain the horizon process from end to end, and C, can explain why each and every point made by the defendants is irrelevant or can be explained. So forgive me for reading that out at some length, but it has been sent to you and to Mr. Utting, and this is back in 2005, so you're plainly aware at this stage of a significant number of complaints from sub-postmasters about Horizon, aren't you? I am, and as I said yesterday, I was aware of the Cleveland's case that I referred to, which was something that I'd asked. Well, it wasn't just the Cleveland's case, was it? So it the, was yeah. quite a number of cases. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah? Not forgetting, of course, that in the Cleveland's case, uh, Paul lost, didn't it? Post office lost. Um, well, I, I can't remember exactly what happened then, but yeah, I think he. he can you not lost. remember that the Cleveland's case was one that the post office lost? I can re recall what these documents have shown me. I can't remember the circumstance of Cleveland's case, but I think one of these documents says that something like £186,000 was paid out because there was a lack of records uh, to respond to it. I can't remember that as my own experience of something that was shared at the time, but that was in one of these documents in the bundle. So I do know that because you've shown me a bundle document that refers to that, that thing uh, back, back then, yes. On receiving this email, did it not occur to you to start wondering whether there was a problem with the Horizon system? I think I was still being assured by IT that there wasn't. Still that verbal assurance, was it? Yeah. What happened to Ms. Talbot's suggestion of identifying a number of individuals or specialist computer firms who could provide a professional and independent report? I don't know. Well, it was addressed to you. Do you not know? No. What happened to her suggestion that Paul and Fujitsu should investigate and identify the data about the number of complaints made by sub-postmasters about the Horizon system since inception? What happened to that suggestion? I don't know, but I would suggest that the handwriting that you showed me on the previous one suggests maybe that was a follow-on to that, but I don't know what then happened as a follow-on to that. The email that uh, you were taken to by Mr. Beer King's counsel about possible settlement, sorry, that document can be taken down now, thank you very much. <clears throat> Do you recall that you were shown an email about settlement um, of the Castleton case, possible settlement? 
I showed so many documents yesterday. I'm Let, happy for you to represent <clears> the thing. I can't, I can't remember what documents I saw yesterday, but please, please do bring it up. And I, I, I hope I won't be trying everyone's patience too much. I'm, I'm sure that I'm, I'm going to be able to finish by lunchtime. So, um, if, if, with the chair's indulgence, if we could just have a look at it again, it's poll three zero nine oh four three seven, and it's at page sixty three. So this is the one where she starts off saying, I've received some very good news about the case, but now need the business to make an urgent decision upon its future conduct. And then she sets out that she's um, heard that there may be a possibility of settlement. Um, in that fourth paragraph last night, our barrister received a compromise offer from Castleton's solicitors. Uh, do, you, do you remember this one now? Uh, yes, so I do now recall that document being shared yesterday, yeah. yeah. So if we just have a look at the fact that it was sent to a number of people, including you, Marie Cockett, John D. Cole, Keith K. Baines, David X. Smith, Richard W. Barker, and Rod Ismay. And in that first paragraph, Sorry, just to, again, also just to look at Castleton Marine Drive, urgent, urgent, urgent. So it's clearly very urgent in her mind. Um, I've received some very good news about this case, but now need the business to make an urgent decision about its future conduct. So um, let's just try to understand then, who does she expect in the business to be making an urgent decision about the conduct of this case? Presumably all the people it's addressed to, yes? Oh, I would presume that amongst that audience would be the person that should be expecting to make an urgent decision. Well, this is a decision about settling the case. So Right, I was going to ask you what is it that's the decision that she's asking for. Yes, so she's so asking she's, for, she's a, asking for um, as, uh, as we've heard already, there's a, a common terminology... Um, she's asking for instructions about settling the case. Okay, right, right. All right, because, right. because lawyers would not settle a case on their own initiative, would they? Obviously, their client has to right. give instructions on that. Yes, do you yeah. accept that? Yeah, and I understand your use of instructions where you've said instructions to settle the case, so I understand. All right, so she's sent this email to these people, and she's expecting these people to be able to give her instructions on settling the case. Okay. Yeah? Yep. And you're one of them. Yep. So how did you, as a group, go about giving her instructions? How did you go about making a decision on whether to settle the case? Well, I don't know. Again, you don't know? No, and I'm sorry. And I know people are doing recording how many times witnesses say I don't know, but I genuinely... I, I can't remember what happened back in 2006 on this. Well, is it reasonable to assume, Mr. Ismay, that Mr. Smith made the decision as the then managing director? No, uh, well, th this was, this, this, was this, this was IT, David no. Smith. Yeah, yeah, yes. sorry, yeah. my mistake. So is it reasonable to assume that the most senior person on that list, whoever that might be, made the decision? Or is it uh, fairer to assume that there was a collective discussion but you now have no memory of it. I'd, I'd expect there would have been a collective decision, and I think in terms of seniority of the people, I think there's th three, so myself, David Smith, and Richard Barker would have been, I mean, that we were all part of what was called the leadership, um, leadership group or something, so we were kind of of a similar level. Um, they, they may have been a little bit more senior because of the breadth of network responsibility but so, so we've narrowed it down to the three people on the list it, it may be fair to infer that between you you made the decision one last possibility was it escalated to people even more senior than you or even to the board that's possible well do you know whether any of those things happened 
No, and I'm, I'm sorry. I'm genuinely sorry. I, I can't remember. I don't what know. we do know is that it wasn't settled, so someone somewhere must have made these decisions. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, I, I accept that a decision must have been made somehow, yeah. Right. Okay. Perhaps we could turn to uh, poll 3069775. and to page two. If we um, look at this email, which uh, is to Mandy Talbot, following on, it seems, or around the same time, and it goes to uh, a similar but slightly different group. It's from Keith K. Baines, and it's copied to Biddy Wiles, Claire Wardle, John D. Cole, Marie Cockett, Richard W. Barker, Rod Ismay, Stephen Dilley. And uh, Keith Baines is suggesting that as part of, this is, this is part of the, the sort of proposed way of perhaps settling the case. Okay. He says, um, uh, I have a few minor changes to suggest, and just to give you the context, Miss Talbot had already suggested a wording, and he's then giving a, a proposed rewording of a statement for Mr. Castleton to make as oh, part of the right. proposed settlement. He says, um, the revised text suggested is this. I, Mr. Lee Castleton, the former postmaster at Marine Drive Post Office, Bridlington, admit that a sum of money was owed by me to Post Office Limited as a result of errors which arose whilst I was the postmaster at the above office. I had thought that this debt arose due to a malfunction of the horizon system, but I now accept that I was mistaken and that the debt arose out of human error. I declare that the horizon system did not contribute to the errors in any way and formally withdraw all statements I made to the contrary. Does that ring any bells? Do you remember this desire to have Mr. Castleton make such a statement? I don't, but I'm clearly part of that chain, but I can't remember that, but I am part of that chain. So you've got no recollection of who came up with the idea of that? No. Or how it was that Paul had come to the view that it could assert that the debt arose out of human error? No, I haven't. No recollection of trying to find out whether that statement would in fact have been true? No, I haven't got a recollection of, of that. Um, my recollections are based on the documents that I've got in these packs, including Helen Rose's statement to the court in 2006. Well, one more document, if I may, on the Castleton case, which uh, includes a response from you, so perhaps may provoke more memory. Right. Poll 309-0437. And it's page 33 this time. If we look at the email from Mandy Talbot first, and then we'll scroll up to your reply. Mandy Talbot to uh, Claire Wardle, Biddy Wiles, Rob G. Wilson. Uh, so that's the head of criminal law, isn't it? Uh, yes. Rod Ismay, Marie Cockett, Keith K. Baines, David X. Smith. So that's, again, the head of IT. Uh, Richard W. Barker, Tony R. Utting, Graham C. Ward, and copied to Doug Evans. This is just to let you know that we have been completely successful in defending all the allegations made by Mr. Castleton. You will recall that he contended that no genuine losses occurred whilst he was a postmaster 
and that any losses were manufactured by the Horizon system. The judgment has entirely vindicated the Horizon system. And she goes on to explain a little more about the technicalities. Um, if we scroll up to your reply, this is from you and back to the same group. Thanks, Mandy. Great news. And thanks to everyone in this email and in your teams, as I know you have had to do a lot of work in supporting the defense case here. Like you, my team faced a stack of witness interviews and court attendances at one time, so the progress and conclusion here is great news. What can we do on a proactive comms front here? We've watched the various inflammatory letters in the sub-postmaster letters page and wanted to be able to assure branches and clients Clients. Uh, clients as in corporate clients such as um, national savings or banks, um, corporate clients of the organisation. That they can rely on the integrity of Horizon. We've had some good articles in the sub-postmaster about MBSC, online service and cash in transit. I'm planning briefs on what P and BA does. Any thoughts on comms following this case? Mr. Ismay, you told us that you were not particularly concerned or interested in comms. Is that correct? Well, clearly I was. This says that I was, so. And I know that further to this, there was pictures of my team and a description of what Providence and Branch Accounting did that either went into the Sub-Postmaster magazine or PO Focus magazine. So I know we had things about communicating what the nature of the team was at some point during my tenure in that job. In 2007, you were very well aware of a significant number of postmaster complaints about Horizon, weren't you? Uh, yes, yes, yes. And you were, along with others in the chain that we looked at earlier, content to assert that this was completely wrong and it was all down to user error, weren't you? Um, yes, and that was based on lots of the other information, examples of which you haven't shared, but which are in the, pack, the bundle, for example, Helen Rose's statement on that case. Was that because user error was an easy cover for failures in Chesterfield procedure? No, it wasn't. And I would refer to that other document I've mentioned a couple of times, that the description in that one, um, the examples where in a number of cases, auditors would go into branches and find safes open, doors open, money left unattended, uh, does not mean that it's clear what, where, which individual may have taken some money, um, or indeed if they did. However, there were a lot of security situations identified, and the examples are in Helen's note on this one that she submitted to the court in 2006, that says that when they went into that branch, they found the safe open, doors open, um, and, and then the other comments that are in that, that note. So I would say that in, in this case, that kind of description of the circumstances of, of the experience of the branch audit would have been something that um, would have influenced the, uh, my view and others' view in the organisation about that case. Clearly, if it turns out that there were um, um, you know, genuine allegations about the nature of the system, I realise, as Justice Fraser said, that that calls into question the ability to use that as evidence in a case. But the mindset of the organisation, and my understanding, was that the audit findings were such as they were and as uh, described in that, that bundle document and that was what would have influenced my thoughts. Now I couldn't remember uh, that particular document until I've seen it in this bundle but looking at what was in that statement, that, that four or five page statement of the court, that is the sort of thing that would have influenced um, my thoughts at the time. And we see here, don't we, that it's not just a uh branches that on your, are on your mind, it's clients. Clients are on your mind. Uh, yes, yep. Because if clients identified 
discrepancies or problems in accounts coming from Chesterfield, that would present a real problem, wouldn't it? If clients were not trusting data, then that would beg a commercial question. Um, and, it, and it's interesting that there's certainly a case of something where there's a National Audit Office report about a client that we worked with who was challenging the data that we'd got. Um, and the, audit, the National Audit Report confirmed that the issue was at the client's end, not at our end. Thank you. That document can come down. You have agreed, haven't you, with uh, Mr Andrew Wynne that the impact programme resulted in significant problems with data feeds in product and branch accounting. Yes? Uh, yes, I did, and I know in the transcript there will be about five or six points I raised yesterday that were those reasons, um, screens being slow, um, data coming in and having to be backed out again. Yes, yes. You say that you raised your concerns. We haven't seen anything in writing. Did you put your concerns in writing? I, I don't know if I put it in writing or not. I, th I, think, that I think there's one thing that's in one of these bundles um, where, where, where I did. So, um. Well, if we look at uh, your report, which is poll 306572, this is your report for Mr David Smith, MD. Right, right. And if we look at page 16... This is your list of problems with um, Horizon that you've identified. Yep. And E is Horizon stroke poll FS differences. In 2005, PMBA moved onto a SAP system, poll FS. This was an exceedingly complex IT migration and there were some issues in management of the cutoff, which meant PMBA was out of sync with some branches in terms of opening balances for cash and bureau. This did not affect the integrity of Horizon and has been catered for in error resolution with branches, but it has affected service to some branches, i.e. where decision-making on cash supply was based on wrong data centrally. Some issues have continued to come to light recently, but this is now under control. It is not relevant to the allegations. Is that what you were talking about? Um, yes, that's what I was talking about, and those kind of things, although I've said that they were under control, they would have been things that were causing immense frustration in my team about having to deal with those things, and that was the kind of sentiment that Andy was experiencing when he said he could feel um, you know, frustration around the team. So contrary to raising your concerns, you're in fact minimising the problem, aren't you, Mr Ismay? Well, I've set out, in, I've set out here that there were issues in my team I, I, I agree that in there I haven't said, and I think the words that I used yesterday was like I was livid about some of the things with the IT team that the kind of number of file errors that we were having to put a file or. A you file don't was. sound very livid with them here, do you? It's not relevant to the allegations. No, and I, I, I don't think that um, writing a document, lividity is, is necessarily a way of, of, of writing a document. But I would say I certainly had conversations with colleagues in IT to say this is this is this is wholly unsatisfactory, the number of files that we're having to wait another day for you to back out and put back in again. I definitely had those conversations. Whether I've put them in emails or not, I don't know. And I should have. Thank you. The document can come down now. Thank you very much. You and poll management generally, no doubt, were worried that big clients like the banks and the utility companies would hear of the problems in your department. No? No, but, but they post... We, I, the, the post office, would have been concerned if clients perceived there to be a problem. Yes, we would have been concerned that clients would think, well... Perhaps pay point or somebody else can do that, that, that work for us. So we wouldn't want to be in a position where the system wasn't working. We felt the system was working, but we felt there was um, comments and the description that he was on Cleveland's one of where IT said to me that there were, it was a, there were unfounded allegations. So we felt we were responding to unfounded allegations 
I, I acknowledge in the context of everything that's coming out of the inquiry, it's a question about, well, it perhaps wasn't unfounded, but at the time, I believed from what was being described to me by other teams who were saying it was unfounded. Um, but obviously, we would have had a concern would a corporate client look at these potentially unfounded observations and themselves think, well, we can't trust that, uh, that organisation, so we'll, we'll put the business somewhere else. But yes, there would have been that concern, but in the context of the organisation believing that it was unfounded allegations. And there would have been concern likewise, would there not, about uh, what we call the multis or the big franchises? that operated multiple branches. You wouldn't have wanted them finding out either, would you? We wouldn't have wanted them to be thinking that the system didn't work either, no. No. The solo sub-postmasters were a considerably easier target, weren't they? No, because I don't think we would want to... Clearly, some... some, some easier to blame user error than to delve into the problems that you didn't want anyone to find out about. Well, could, could, could I just respond a bit on that one? So, I think... I know there is criticism in here of, was the NFSP not a representative body for sub-postmasters? I believed it was. It was a representative body for members. And we were having conversations with the NFSP um, to talk about um, their perception of issues uh, and allegations that were being made. And they, and so there's members of their executive committee that we were at meetings with, who would say, well, I'm running a post office, I'm not experiencing these issues, and the people that I talk to aren't experiencing these issues. So we had what is an awful situation for the postmasters who are concerned in, in, in this case here. Awful situation for what, was a, what, we, what we understood at the time was a, a, a minority of post office branches within the network. And I was receiving a vibe from... Um, National Federation of Sub-Postmasters colleagues who talked to lots and lots of sub-postmasters who themselves were saying, well, my branch, I don't have these problems in my branch and, and, and the members who I'm speaking to aren't having those problems either. So that sort of feedback that whilst yesterday I referred to something where, which we may come to in a future phase, four sub-postmasters I think came and did some work in, in Chesterfield to kind of look at, at things later on. I was having conversations with the executive of the National Federation of Postmasters, who they were feeling, who are users of the system, that they were um, assured through the daily practice of, of, of using the system. Um, and that's the context, and another part of the context that, that led to the, um, the, 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 the things that we're talking about here. Mr Ismay, you had a personal interest in suppressing anything that suggested your department was out of control, didn't you? No. And that's I, why you I, I, I were the man to write the one-sided 2010 review, isn't it? No, no. It's not. I, I went into a team that had got backlogs that had arisen because of the cutover issues when the, when the migration into the SAP system went in. I had open discussions with the NFSP and you've probably, with all the access, you've probably got some of those slideshows of things where I've got slides presented to the NFSP talking about backlog resolution and a prioritisation of how we deal with, in, with this, with different products to get up to date on that area. I was totally open with the, the representatives of the sub-postmaster community about the, um, the backlogs and the my acceptance and the team's acceptance of the importance of getting on to having up-to-date, timely conversations with sub-postmasters, not raising um, transaction corrections months and months in arrears. And the branch audit team would get in touch with my team to ask about whether there were any errors, notices pending or transaction corrections to close that loop during the period where there's a backlog. But I was very much um, keen to be up to date, working effectively with sub postmasters. This is a horrible situation that we're in here, and I'm sorry about how all this has ended up, but I was not trying to conceal something uh, in my team. I was openly with the post office executive and with an NFSP who are outside of the post office, very clear with them 
that my team, when I inherited it, was in arrears on things, and it took us quite a time to work through getting up to date uh, on that. But I was not concealing that at all. Uh, and, and, and there will be things that, that you will be able to find in back issues of sub postmaster or focus that, that indicate exactly that kind of thing. Well, thank you very much for answering my questions. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Uh, sir, there are not. I just want to um, ask one or two further questions, uh, if I may, Mr. Ismay. Uh, yes, yes, thank you. And it, really to, to, to do something similar in relation to Seema Mistra, as um, you've been doing this morning in the Castleton case, but with particular reference to those emails which you, we poured over yesterday, uh, which were inviting you to agree to further investigations, all right? Uh, yes. And I, I don't want to put the documents up on the screen, I want to see if my understanding is correct, all right? And please feel free to contradict me. And if Mr. Beer thinks that I've not got something right, he can intervene as well. This all started, as I understand it, with the judge in the Seema Mistra case um, at a preliminary stage suggesting that the expert witnesses for the respective parties should meet to discuss various issues, all right? And I think that emerges clearly from that email chain that you saw. Right, okay, yep. And um, <clears throat> so not surprisingly, the expert witnesses did meet, and it was following their meeting that the defense solicitor, um, Izzy Hogg, wrote the email which asked, in effect, for permission to carry out three investigations. We needn't concern ourselves with the details of the investigation. She was asking, will you facilitate these further investigations? All right? Okay, yeah. And that obviously got its way to um, the Paul legal team, and in particular, Mr. Singh. And as I understand it, what you've been telling me is that you would have expected Mr. Singh to have communicated directly with you as to whether or not that should occur? Yes, I, I would have expected him to have communicated directly with me and for him to be the interface point back into the defence uh, yeah. with whatever... Yeah, I've got that. Yeah. that that's fine. Yeah. Now, so am I correct, therefore, in thinking that it was for you, ultimately to make the decision as to whether the uh, request should be granted, albeit that you expected to have proper input directly from Mr Singh? No, I, I don't think there was any way in which it was appropriate for me to be making a decision there. I think right. I would have... Well, well, let's stop at that point then. Mr Singh clearly is under the impression that um, you could make that decision. So when it finally came to you, as it did, that you were in effect being asked to make that decision, did you write an email to anyone saying, this is not for me to determine? It must be determined by Mr. X or Ms. Y. I, I don't know. I would expect you if I'd sent an email, it would have been produced in the evidence, so. Right, well, because what appears to have happened uh, and again, I'm choosing my words carefully, what appears to have happened is that you did engage with it to the extent of discussing it with Andrew Wynn. Yes, it, it looks like Andy received the message from John Longman and came, yeah. came to me and then I evidently expressed um, um, concern about an open-ended invite. And yeah, sure. Uh, sure, so you did engage with it with Mr. Wynn, but as far as you can remember, at least, you didn't send an email to anyone expressing your reservations. That was done by Mr. Wynn. Um, yeah, 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 and it, it, yeah, it was. It looks like it was yeah, done by right. him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so, on the one hand, and you may have a point, if I may say so, 
you um, would have expected that Mr. Singh would have communicated directly with you. But is it fair for me to consider that you should also have directly communicated either with Mr. Singh or with someone else who you may wish to identify? Look, this decision is not for me. Please ensure that it is dealt with by the right person. Um, yeah, I think it's quite reasonable for you, you to say that I should have formally corresponded back with um, Mr. Singh about that. Um, right. I would have so, expected then him to have come back if and, and said, well, I haven't heard from you, Rod. Um, this is a legal requirement. You must do it. And it, it doesn't look like there was any follow back. So um, I, I don't, I, it, given everything that we've got and that we've looked at, I, I, I can't understand why there then wasn't some follow back from Mr. Singh yeah. to say, you still haven't done this. All right. What we do have was an email some weeks later which appears to suggest that you did, in fact, make a decision that those um, investigations weren't to be facilitated. And Mr. B has asked you about that, so I'm not going to go over that ground again. Yeah, yeah. But if you didn't make the decision um, not to facilitate the investigations, do you know if anybody else addressed their minds to that? I, d I don't know if anybody else did, but again, I'd think that it should have been a black and white decision for Mr Singh to know should this happen or not. And if it hadn't happened, I would have expected under the kind of professional processes that a solicitor would go under that they would think this should have happened, it hasn't happened, I need to make sure it happens. All right. And so far as you were concerned, you have never seen a document in which someone has made a decision clear a clear decision that these investigations will not be facilitated. Is, is that right? Yeah, yes. Okay, right. Well, I think I've understood it. Um, and you, I don't think you've needed to contradict the way I've expressed it to you uh, in terms of your own involvement in this. Is that fair? Yeah, um, so could you ask that question again? I'm sorry. Yeah, I, I mean, as we were going through it, you didn't say to me, Sorry, Chair, you got that wrong, or that's not right, and all the rest of it. So I've got the basic factual uh, chronology correct, have I? Yes, I, th I, think, I, th I think you have. Could, would it be possible for me to replay something to you to make sure that I've understood all right. what yeah, you're... Yeah, by all yeah. means, yeah. So, 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 so my fundamental point is that I really would have expected the, the solicitors to know whether or not something should be done, and it was for them to make that decision, not for yeah. me to... Yeah. Well, can I put this to you then, um, just as a slight um, nuance so that nobody's under any misapprehension? It may very well be said by the solicitors, I don't know, we'll have to wait and see, that they give advice but they don't make the decision. You understand? Yes. So no. the thing may well have said, for example... Right, OK. I th my advice to you... Um, either Mr. Ismay or Mr. X, whoever the decision maker is, that you should accede to this request or you should refuse it and then explain why. But he wouldn't be the ultimate decision maker. Do you understand uh, the, the distinction that I'm drawing? Yeah, no, I, absolutely. That, that's helpful. I, I, I do understand that. I, again, I would have then expected that to be written in some sort of correspondence yeah. with him coming back stating that. But what you've said makes sense. So, so you and I are in agreement that there should really be a paper trail um, explaining precisely what occurred. Yes. And at the moment, at least, that Mr. Beer may say, I'm not on top of certain documents, but at the moment, you and I haven't seen any such paper trail. Uh, yes, I, I agree, yeah. Fine. All right. Thank you. Right, thank well, you. That, thank you very much for uh, answering questions over a day and a half. I, I think Mr. Beer did say... Uh, that it was possible that you may be asked further questions in due course. If you are to be asked further questions in due course, then uh, as uh, with this current session, you'll be served with what's called a Rule 9 request, outlining the areas about which you should answer questions, all right? Okay, I understand, yes. Fine. So that brings um, 
this session to an end, does it, Mr Beer? Uh, yes, it does. Uh, so we're back uh, 10 a.m. on Tuesday, please. Fine. All right, then. So we're adjourned till 10 a.m. on Tuesday morning. Thanks. Thank you Thanks very much. Right. Thank you.